whatever that difference might be that we cling to. You know, when a church doesn't see all the people or can't see all of the people or, you know, the people can't see themselves in the, in, in the church, the like church begins to atrophy and, um, you know, lose its vitality, uh, church begins to die. You know, that that, that that vital voice that the church can have in the community begins to not be heard when the church can't see all of the people. Your mindset changes. And when your mind changes, um, it's like this, the scripture that says, you know, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. When your mind changes so much, so much else changes because you're not thinking the same way. Getting to know and love all of the people means that you're learning more about that story and you're learning to accept that person for all of the, all of the layers that come with them. Our calling is not just to certain people in certain places and certain backgrounds, but it is to love uh, one another, to love all. You know, there's some work that's gotta be done uh, for you to truly uh, be able to accept and for a person to truly be able to feel that acceptance. There's some work that you gotta do with each other uh, in order for that, that, that full acceptance and that full, you know, uh, um, you know, love to, to kind of manifest itself. Seeing all the people with love in your heart, in your mind and your soul, I mean, it, it just couldn't get any better than that. With our chalk at the ready, the first pillar drawn reminds us to see all the people. It is one of the four actions to build a bridge of vitality. A vital church sees all the people. This relies not on eyesight, but on heart sight that happens in conversation and is developed through relationships. As you heard from this sampling of voices, seeing all the people is measured by the degree to which people inside and outside the walls of the church are known, accepted, respected, and valued as children of God by the church. It requires church leaders and members to experience a transformed mindset, to interrupt their fears and biases, to grow in cultural humility, and to build authentic relationships instead of transactional ones. Seeing all the people is an outward mindset that builds relationships with neighbors to create spaces of belonging, inclusion, and to learn from shifting contexts. It means actively erasing boundaries that exist in the communities that we're a part of. When we listen with love in our hearts to the community's voice, one conversation at a time, especially with those on the margins, the Holy Spirit changes us and inspires us. Let's hear a word from the late Reverend Junius Dotson on why seeing all the people is critical part of our discipleship. No, discipleship see. begins with relationship. We cannot disciple people that we are not in relationship with. We have to see the people that God has called us to reach. This must be the foundation of intentional discipleship. Engaging our community begins with a deep and authentic love for every person created in the image of God. Hello, I'm Junius Dodson, General Secretary and CEO of Discipleship Ministries of the United Methodist Church. I'm here on set of our latest short film for See All the People, a movement of churches dedicated to engaging the communities around our congregations. In my travels to Johannesburg, South Africa, I learned a greeting called Sawabona. It is a greeting used particularly in the northern natal tribes. It means, I see you, or we see you. And the traditional response is, Yebo Sawabona, which means, yes, I see you too. Friends, seeing is a dialogue. It is an invitation to participate in another's life. I see you means I acknowledge the dignity of your existence. It was in the context of seeing the people that Jesus reminds us through prayer of our call to be engaged in our communities. Matthew 9, verses 36 through 38, describes Jesus as seeing the crowds, 
and having compassion for them. Our daily prayer should be that we see people the way Jesus sees them. This personal dimension of discipleship means we see all of the people with a desire to be in authentic conversation. We yearn to listen deeply to their story. We have a real desire to know people and to be committed to being in relationship with our neighbors. I believe when these encounters are authentic, organic, and consistent, there will be honest moments to share our faith story and to invite people on a lifelong journey to follow Jesus. When we take time to develop relationships, we create space for the non-religious and the nominally religious, or even those who have rejected the church might find room to search and explore Christianity. This space is created because we are in relationships that are life-giving and not simply transactional. Imagine what it would look like to begin to see people who are not currently a part of our church, the people outside our doors, the people across the street and throughout our communities. What would it look like if we focused on developing meaningful relationships, bringing Jesus into the center of our lives and all that we do, what would it look like to have as our foundation of discipleship persons who are growing in Christ and actively engaging the community? May your love for your community become as deep and wide as God's love for us. May it flow just like discovering a love that is deep and vast as an endless sea. My prayers are with you as you take your next step to engaging your community. To learn more and download free resources, go to seeallthepeople.org. Jesus' heart broke as he got to know people. As he and we pray for harvest hands, we understand that this isn't for the survival of the institution of church. It's, it isn't just to keep our doors open, but for sharing the love and grace of God so that people can live life to the full. Using the same mentee link in the chat, URL plus code or the QR code, answer the next question you see, which is, what is one word you would use to describe the importance of seeing all the people? We told you this would be interactive and already you are active. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Acceptance, yes, relationship, love again. Interesting theme we have going here today. Very interesting theme. So, and again, if you're, if you're new, if you're just logging in now, you'll see at the top of this screen that is getting populated by answers from voices across our beautiful annual conference, the answer to this question. You can participate also by typing in menti.com and the code that you see at the top of the screen. Great, relationship, love, inclusion. Amen and amen for all of the words that I can't see because they're too small <laughs> with my old eyes. The next question we have for you is, let us know what most prevents you from striking up a conversation with someone you don't know. So the answers you see here, what we've learned in our work, um, this whole team in our work, is that there's a lot of fear and trepidation around getting to know someone that you don't know. So we'd love, and these are the answers that we hear most often. You can skip an answer if it doesn't pertain to you or if, it, or if, it, if, you, if you, you never think about that, please make it be strongly disagree, right? So go ahead and we're starting to see the codes collect. And we see here, um, the way that the, this, this particular graph works is that um, the average you see as the bubble score, but the, there, you see there are peaks and valleys. So we don't all, uh, respond to this the same way. Some, we have many people who feel like it's not their job. Well, friends, it is your job. It is your job to get to know new people as disciples of Jesus Christ. Um, nothing. We have some people who, who don't have any barriers. So why, how many are you doing a day? How many new people are you building relationships with a day? Being anxious and fearful. I know pe some people have expressed um, uh, social anxiety and that kind of thing, but we have to realize that in our inadequacy and our fear and our I don't know how, 
God is big enough to handle all of it, and there are also resources available for you. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, we believe that this naming of what is is a critical part of getting to be better. Um, <laughs> again, don't forget to leave your mentee open. We'll be coming back um, to this again. Um, and don't forget where you stand as you stretch out of your comfort zone to see all the people. La manera como puedo ayudar a que las personas entiendan es contando mi propia experiencia, cómo Dios transformó mi vida, cómo fue mi aliciente para seguir adelante y cómo me sigue enseñando día tras día, a pesar de que ya conozca algún verso de la Biblia, Él sigue mostrándose de manera diferente a medida que voy caminando. Entonces, con esa experiencia puedo decir que el discipulado es tan importante porque es ese caminar en la jornada propia de cada uno a la manera que Dios quiere que vayamos con él. Deepening discipleship in a faith community means, you know, just growing together in, in our walk towards, you know, the perfection that, 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 that we hope to, to arrive at, you know, by the time we, you know, meet our Savior. One of my favorite images of deep discipleship or like illustrations, I guess, is, um, is a vineyard where um, vines that are not using artificial water sources yield uh, a better quality fruit. Whereas a lot of vineyards that have moved to more artificial sources of water um, see that they're producing more fruit but it's not a high quality, it's, there's not a depth to it. And sometimes, you know, we have to travel, you know, we have to travel a road multiple times and each time we, we kind of, you know, go down the road again, you know, we learn a little more, we pick up a little more, we make a connection that, that becomes important in our lives. You know, we, we reaffirm a connection, you know, it's just, you know, doing that practice over and over. I guess that's why we call it a practice, because it's not something you do one time, and all of a sudden you have this, you know, you know, deeper discipleship, <laughs> you know, yearning inside you. We have sort of come to know too many artificial sources of sustenance for our discipleship. Deep discipleship, it's really coming back to the natural source of of our life, which is Christ. Another thing, uh, otra cosa que me gustaría complementar a esta idea es que es importante que atraigamos a los niños, porque es ahí donde empezamos a construir su confianza en el Señor. Cuando esos niños son adolescentes, pueden estar seguros de que ya la semilla está dentro de su corazón. Y cuando son adolescentes y llegan a ser universitarios, jóvenes universitarios, y se alejan de nosotros, pueden tener la seguridad que donde quiera que ellos vayan, Dios está con ellos. Y cualquier circunstancia que ellos choquen, Dios está con ellos. Entonces es importante que cuidemos de nuestros niños, de nuestros adolescentes, de nuestros jóvenes y por supuesto que también de nuestras personas mayores, porque ellos son la sabiduría que nos va a ayudar a nosotros a enfrentar nuevos retos. Greetings. 
The second pillar drawn represents deepening discipleship. The mission of each United Methodist Church is to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. Members of a vital church take responsibility for growing in faith by cultivating Christian practices through the means of grace. Vital churches have a working definition of what a disciple is, a biblically grounded and contextually relevant understanding of who Jesus is, an understanding of what maturing in discipleship looks like and provides simple, obvious, and strategic steps for people at various stages of life and spiritual maturity to grow as followers of Jesus Christ for personal, local, and global impact. In other words, churches who are vital have an intentional plan for following Christ as we transform the world. Since 2018, we have uplifted the rule of discipleship as our shared definition of a disciple and discipleship rooted in the great commandment and great commission. When combined with our Wesleyan theology of grace, it is to witness to Jesus Christ and to follow his teaching through acts of justice, compassion, devotion, and worship under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. We believe that salvation entails renewal of both individuals and the world. Our faithful response to God's saving grace has both a personal and social dimension as we grow in holiness of heart and life. And our love of God is always linked with our love of neighbor, a passion for justice and renewal in the life of the world as we go on to perfection. Now, many have asked, what is the difference between compassion and justice? Compassion or compassionate service is showing kindness for another person, such as visiting the sick, preparing a meal for someone in need. And justice it is an action that creates a change that makes things fairer and equitable and seeks to address the system or the root of the concern. Now the list on the screen created by Discipleship Ministries is not meant to be comprehensive, nor is it to give us a picture of what justice looks like. It is designed to help us to envision a first step from compassion toward justice. For Wesley, a form of personal piety, devotion and compassion, unanchored in social holiness, worship and justice is worth examining and reconsidering as we live the gospel of Jesus Christ. didn't pop up on the screen, so we are going to make sure that you have it because you'll need to have a sense of that before we go into our quiz. <laughs> um, so the, bear with us for a minute, um, or not. Let's just go into Menti and see how you do. So with that definition and understanding of the difference between compassion and justice, we're going to run a Menti quiz for you to see um, for you to select the, the response that best represents an act of justice, and on our website we will have this resource that Stacy mentioned for you. So you're going to log in and we're going to play a little game. Um, you'll have 15 seconds to select the response that best represents an act of justice, and you'll see them on your device better than I can see them from mine. So befriend someone who comes up from a different culture, there you go. Write a letter to your congressperson about an issue of discrimination is the answer that best represents an act of justice versus befriending someone who comes from a different culture or visiting someone who's wrongfully imprisoned due to discrimination. So gr great job for the 58 of you. Woohoo! <laughs> Let's do the next one. So, oh, oh, I forgot, we have a leaderboard. So if you've, if you've named yourself, you can see where you stood based on the answer that you gave and how fast you gave it. The next question. So again, you're gonna be given three options. Look at your phone to see them. Explore how your congregation will assist in alleviating homelessness. Vote on policies that support living wages and affordable housing. Pack lunches for unhoused neighbor. Which is compassion? Which one of those is best represents an act of compassion? 
Yes. Pack lunches for unhoused neighbors. Good, you guys didn't need the chart. Awesome, awesome, awesome. One more, one more try. Let's do another, another quiz and see how the leaderboard changed. It's never too late to, to join this game, folks. So um, we have a close, a close, uh, close running there. Question three. And again, fast answers are not as important to us. Leaderboards are not as important to us, but um, it just makes it some fun. Best represents an act of justice, addresses policies in schools that penalize food insecure students, pack backpacks of food for those who are in free or reduced lunch, run a food pantry or food insecure families. All of these things are good. It's just trying to differentiate the justice from the compassion. Yes, address policies. I think, friends, that you've, you, you, you get it. Um, so we were trying to give you some food for thought there as that was a question that kept coming up um, with our boards. On Christ the solid rock I stand All of the ground is sinking sand All of the ground is sinking sand There shouldn't be people without homes, right? This, this world, this government, the church has plenty of, plenty of money and plenty of resources to make sure that there aren't people on the streets and that those same people have a meal to eat, right? So when we live in love like God, that means providing homes, providing shelter, providing food um, for millions of people that don't have it, treating people with respect. There are plenty of places where we see respect not being given to women, being given to queer people, being given to people of color. Um, and I think living loving like God is, is putting people before yourself. Gandhi had a quote that said, I love your Jesus. I don't love your Christians. If your Christians were more like Jesus, all of India would be Christian. There's a, a standard in people's minds of, of living like Jesus. All are welcome, no matter what you look like, where you were born, who you love, um, what your cultural background is, what your financial situation is, how you're dressed up, you are welcome and loved in the church. Um, and I really think that's really living and loving like Jesus. You know, whatever it is that makes two people or a group of people or a community love and accept each other, that's what living and loving like Jesus looks like in that context. Having the freedom now to really live and love like Jesus did, I think that really helps me to connect with God on a deeper level and helps me to understand who I am as a Christian and my role in this world. When when we think about loving and living like Jesus, like it's not a Hallmark card, it's not a, um, a fairy tale story, it's about surrender, it's about, um, and it's about the cross, it's about putting ourselves um, in a place, if needed, a place of pain or of sorrow or of um, danger to be with or advocate for um, others. And that doesn't mean that there aren't beautiful moments along the way that don't require that, but just I think we cling to those um, easier moments um, over some of the ones that maybe are far more uncomfortable. The third pillar has been drawn to represent living and loving like Jesus. This pillar is not for the faint of heart. Living and loving like Jesus is dangerous because this love proclaims freedom for the prisoners, recovery of sight for the blind, liberty for the oppressed, 
and proclaims the year of the Lord's favor. Living and loving like Jesus moves us from the seats to the streets as we take the gospel beyond the walls of our buildings. And it means crossing the chasm by building bridges to those who may feel left out for not fully accepted by the church. Disciples who live and love like Jesus are active in the places they go, and they are active in the marketplace. Vital churches live and love like Jesus. We've added a word to each of the five aspects of the rule of discipleship to help illuminate it a bit more. And so, Christy, let's see if the BWC annual conference members can help us clarify the characteristics each aspect brings. Thanks, Neil. Uh, let's, let's see. They, they did good on that last one. So using the five actions contained within the rule of discipleship, um, make sure you're in mentee. And we're going to go right there now. Um, you're going to hear me describe a marketplace behavior, something that happens outside of the church. Lots of times we think about um, worship only inside the church, but friends, we worship everywhere, right? We worship God everywhere. While all are required to live in love like Jesus, one aspect is more predominant. You will only use each answer once. So you'll get the same five answers each time. Which best illuminates this, um, recognizes the image of God in the other, and expresses reverence and worthiness of that child of God in each encounter? Which, which aspect is it? I'm, I'm sorry, <laughs> camera. Um, is it compassionate service, inclusive witness, mindful devotion, or persistent justice? It looks like, friends, you're thinking uh, more about it being, um, <laughs> it's interesting, inclusive witness, interesting. So, so when we think about uh, expressing the reverence and is it worship? Uh, we, we sort of think of that more as the, as, the, as the wholehearted worship, but we will take under advisement from you wise people that this might be inclusive witness as primary. Thank you. Next slide. You're helping us learn what make, what's, what's connecting. Demonstrates radical hospitality and shares faith as led by the Holy Spirit. So if you answered the, an incorrect answer last time, you can use any of the answers, I guess, here. So here we have, again, the same options, demonstrates radical hospitality and shares faith as led by the Holy Spirit. I see compassionate service and inclusive witness are neck and neck here. Yes, we would say this is inclusive witness, right? Radical hospitality is radical in the sense that it's open to all. The table is open to all. We are open to all. Great. Let's see about the next one. Wonderful. Wonderful. Helps out no matter position or role and invites others to serve in alignment with their interests. Is that more compassionate service? Not inclusive witness because we already know that that's been taken. Mindful devotion, persistent justice, or wholehearted worship. So compassionate service, y'all. You, yep, you're on it. Compassionate service. And again, for those of you who are naming other aspects, it's really important that we understand that Jesus was not divided. Jesus was a whole person. Jesus did all five things all the time, and we are to do the same. So it's sort of not surprising to me that we don't all agree on which one, because there's a thread of, of, <laughs> there's a thread of love throughout all five. Thank you. Let's go to the next one. Practices inclusion, diversity, equity, and anti-racism. By, by practicing inclusion, diversity, equity, and anti-racism, what do disciples evidence? Persistent justice jumped out in the lead, and we would, we would agree that's, that's, that's evidence of, 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 of persistent justice. Perfect, perfect. And the last one. Is there a last one? I lost track. Offers a word of encouragement, authenticity, authentically and humbly, rooted in God's great love, mercy, and grace, without being churchy or judgmental. Yes. Interesting. So, we, uh, so this one feels like it could be lots of things. Um, I was doing this with a group once, and they were like, this is it. This is all of them right here. <laughs> Mindful devotion. So, so hopefully that helps you understand that that marketplace, disciples in the marketplace really requires us being all in. 
and all love in these various dimensions of what that means. We are now going to, <clears throat> sorry, we're fortunate enough to be joined by a spoken word artist named Layla Jackson, Ms. Layla Jackson, so hopefully she'll be spotlighted for us. She is a spoken word artist, an author, poet, musician, and member of Jones Memorial United Methodist Church in the Greater Washington District. I'm so happy, our team is so happy that um, Ms. Layla is joining us today. She'll be a junior in college this fall, majoring in psychology with a minor in creative writing, and she's studying to become a, mu a music therapist. Very gifted young woman. Um, please, won't you give, us a, give her a warm BWC Zoom welcome on mute. Hi and good morning everyone. Today I will be reading a poem that I have written myself entitled, A Love Like This is Something to be Cherished. Sometimes there are days where I struggle, where getting out of bed seems impossible, when smiling feels more like a task than a genuine reaction. And on these days, when everything is coming down on me at once, when everything feels too hard for me to get through, I realize I'm never alone in this struggle. Not when I have God beside me and the compassion of my sisters and brothers surrounding me. They show me what it means to deepen our discipleship, to be a caring human no matter how different we all may be. They show me what it means to care and to live and to love like Jesus. They show me what it means to be a true disciple, what it means to uplift someone struggling around them, what it means to have someone help me brush my hair and find clean clothes and regain that motivation to keep pushing another day. They don't judge me, don't deepen the shame that has become of my situation, but instead they embrace me. Pull me into loving arms, let me see all the people that will show me a love that can fill craters and warm bellies. They show me that the people that help multiply the impact by gifting me with the love and care that they gift anyone else who needed it and craved it. These people who stand under God, these people of all shapes and sizes, these people of all color and denominations, these people that took me in and loved me with the type of love that will forever be unmatched from any one person, these people in their genuineness have shown me what it means to be loved and cared for and appreciated and seen. And I believe that a love like that is something we should all embrace under God. Thank you so much. Thank you and amen. Um, connected with a school in the community, um, Logan Elementary School. We started um, developing this relationship with them, a partnership. And the surprising thing is they were looking for partners also, okay? They had started this community program. 
So they were looking for partners, we were looking for partners, and we just connected so well. The image of like people in a canoe but rowing in different directions. I think that happens all the time. And so multiply your impact to me really means we're in the canoe and we're heading in the same direction and we're rowing in the same direction. And that's allowing us to accomplish so much more than if we're all just scattered trying to do our own thing. If churches are, you know, comprised of members who are all trying to do that same thing, then, you know, maybe we make an impact, you know, on the block where the church is located. And, you know, if, if the church down the street, you know, tries to do the same thing, then maybe we can cover, you know, a mile. And, you know, if, you know, all of the churches, the 600 churches in the Baltimore Washington Conference do that, you know, you know, maybe we can er eradicate some sort of suffering in this area where we live. If you haven't made the connections within that community, or if you haven't made a great enough impact in that community, then can you really justify being in that community? Something the church has not always been good at is listening, um, trying to understand the, the real issues that the community is facing, the real problems that exist, but not just understanding the issues and problems, but seeing where are there groups or people or resources already being put to use that we can join in with, um, where we try to uh, diagnose the problem and put a solution to it without having done that crucial step of, of listening and understanding. I'm engaged both in that church and in my community association, and I think that there can be such synergy there. Um, it's, and it's like everybody wants to work together. Everybody is about building relationships. And to me, that's, well, I think to all of us, that's where it begins, building relationships. Uh, measuring the dollars isn't what's important. Measuring the number of buildings that may have been built isn't what's important. What you want to measure is the people that you've touched and the people who have touched you, because that's what matters. That's what makes you vibrant. That's what makes them vibrant. Uh, so often we want to hang on to or cling to what we know, what we've always done, whereas you know, there's so many other new opportunities that God may be calling us to um, that require us to let go of um, all of those preconceived things that we have. Um, and if we were able to really let go and see what God might do with that, I think that's where we could really see that multiply the impact, that it becomes less about us and what we want and more about um, where we see God calling us to be in the midst of um, our communities. The final, the final pillar that holds up the bridge of vitality represents multiplying impact. Vital churches multiply their impact. You heard these lady talking about partnerships, alignment, connection, listening, maximizing resources, synergy, joining with others, letting go, measuring what matters, progress on where God is calling us to be in the midst of our communities. We talk about this fourth pillar last, because we want to be sure we aren't multiplying the wrong things. The world has enough exclusion, negative stereotyping, and cliques who care more about what they want than what God wants. Our picture of impact is a multiplication sign that shows that we are a gathered and sent people. Gathered for centering in on God's purpose for us and sent outside the walls of our buildings for participating in God's harvest. Connecting the why, what, and how of what we do. Aligning everything with the mission and where God is calling the church in this season is essential. Measuring impact on what matters most rather than money or partner participation numbers is essential. 
as we increase our capacity to build relationships, develop leaders, and partner with others. Many churches mistake activity for impact. We don't need churches to do more things, just more focus on what God is calling forth. On the screen, you see some distinctions made between inputs, outputs, and outcomes. Inputs are our activities that include our use of time, talent, and treasure. Outputs are things we immediately can track after an activity happens. This is why they are also called leading indicators. And outcomes, or lagging indicators, are short, mid, or long-term goals connected to our mission. Often the church is missing that middle column in its thinking, which prevents it from getting real-time feedback on its activities. Let's take a look at some personal examples before applying this to the church. Let's say your long-term outcome is improved health and you have identified the need to lose weight as an important immediate goal. So your activity would be dieting and exercise. The leading indicator would be da taking daily calories in, calories out, so that the goal of losing weight is achieved. Just stepping on the scale is insufficient to keep your activities in line with your desired outcome. Dieting and exercise not your thing? How about maintaining a budget for the activity? The output or leading indicator is spending less than income. The outcome we may seek is enough money to retire at 70 or financial viability. Let's look at a church measure using one of the pillars. A church that is seeing all the people builds authentic relationships that honor the divine and the gifts of each person. Eventually, if one does well and consistently, the church reflects the diversity of its community and is inclusive, diverse, equitable, and anti-racist. This could be an outcome. What is the best activity to start? Let's say building relationships with new people in the community through relationships or one-on-one -on -one meetings. If that's our activity, a leading indicator would be how many new relationships or one-on-ones per week. Now let's do one more. A church that multiplies its impact has let go of its need to be all things to all people. It is ready for doing something new has discerned and is aligned around what difference God is calling them to make in the name of Jesus and has created metrics that helps them know whether or not they are making progress in that very specific area. For example, if the outcome is literacy, we might track on grade level reading. If that is our outcome, the leading indicator could be the number of volunteer hours spent reading each week or month. This is so important. Too often we are so caught up in doing church that we don't make time to reflect on what we need to stop or start doing to be the church that God is calling us to be. We'd love to hear where you find yourself in this area of multiplying impact. Christy? Hey, <laughs> sorry. Thank you for that beautiful, beautiful example. On Menti, you'll see this um, choices about where your congregation is on these aspects of multiplying impact. So help us understand, um, are you, do you have leaders who are mentoring and being mentored? Do you have all activities aligned to the mission? Is the building being maximized for the greatest common good? Have you discerned already, done the hard work of discerning where God's calling us to meet a real situation in the community? And by the way, that discernment cannot just be within the community of the, within the four walls. It's a wider community has to be included in that discernment. We have an imp do you have an impact measure that excites you and others in the community? Please share with us where you are in that and you are sharing with us where you are in that. Um, and it's all good. It's just important that we're honest and we're not trying to 
um, sugarcoat our reality because it's very difficult to make changes if you don't, it's very difficult to get where you, where God's calling you if you're not being real to yourself about where you are, where you're starting. So we see, um, again, a wide range of responses. And this idea of impact measure is new for the church. And it's going to be something you're going to be um, seeing more and hearing more about. It's part of what we're doing in some of the um, pathways, the congregational development pathways. But we'll also be offering that outside of that. Um, great. So leaders being mentored and mentored and mentoring and mentoring mentored um, is something that you could implement fairly quickly, right? Some of these others are going to take you a little longer to get to. Thank you so much for sharing where you are because it helps us even know that there's not a clear, a clear place where we're um, strongly agreeing, um, and there's not a clear place where we're, you know, we're sort of all in the middle, all in the middle. So thank you for, for your honesty there. Hopefully that's unpacked for you a bit more about what multiplying your impact really means. So we are going to, again, be rooted and reminded of where we stand as we do this work together. The four pillars are nonlinear and interactive. The roadway to 100% of our churches becoming 100% vital is formed through our continuous action. Cultivating cultural humility results in a church that embodies inclusion, diversity, equity, and anti-racism. Building beloved community involves relationships across lines of difference and being in ministry with, not for the community, for the thriving of all people. Following Jesus is about witnessing through acts of justice, compassion, devotion, and worship under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. And connecting the why, what, and how. This entails strategy, discipleship pathways, multiplying leaders, call, vision, mission, and staying focused on what matters most to God. As we cross the bridge into God's preferred future, individually, congregationally, and connectionally, the foundation is strengthened by the variety of teams, programs, and resources available through your district offices and conference teams. This includes district missional action planning, or DMAP, congregational vitality pathways, We Rise United, Training Tuesday, Next, Leader, Next Level Leader events, and the five fo foci. We are making this journey together. Even as we may take different lanes and paths, we are in this together. Please share with us what you've learned as we move back to Menti. So we have three closing questions for you. How has your understanding of vitality been shaped by our time, our short time here together? Hopefully your, your understanding of vitality has been shaped, and we'd like to hear what sort of... Uh, rose up for you in this time together um, as you think about vitality, broadening, affirmed, peace. Praise God, because I know there's a lot of anxiety anytime we say vitality, so peace, I thank God for that. Deepened, praise God, clarified, focus, encouraged, praise be to God, because that's what we must do with one another, is be encouragers, um, and to continue to help us go deeper 
and stay focused on the main thing. Thank, praise God. And we will, we're going to make these word clouds and everything that we've experienced today available on that web page of um, bwcumc.com backslash vitality. That is a work in process. We will be adding um, this content from today there. Thank you. I'd love to now hear, we would love, in a wall of statements, more than one word, please type more than one word. What's coming alive in you that can create more vitality? What is coming alive in you, just name it, that can create more vitality for yourself, your church, your community, the world? What is coming alive in you? And we're going to see as people populate, you can use as many, you can, you can type a whole sentence here if you'd like, um, but thank you for these partnerships, excitement, sharing love, teaching love, awareness, hope, lots of hope, <laughs> a willingness to stretch, reinvention, golf. So maybe there's a golf church in, the, in, the, in someone's future instead of a puppy church. Encouragement. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. So please um, go ahead and name all of those things. And we're going to go to the last question, which is to collect any, any questions you have or anything that as we were going through the day, you're like, I really don't understand this part. We want to know that. We're going to take these off the screen, but we'll leave this screen open. Um, if you go to the next one, sorry, the next slide that says, what questions do you have? What needs more explanation? We're going to take that down so you can really share with us what needs a uh, better uh, explanation or what, what questions do you really have so that we might resource you better. So um, we, we are just so thankful for your participation here today. We don't have to show the what people, what questions people have um, on the screen anymore as we close. Chalk is fun, but messy. While it is no longer used in most US classrooms, it is still used outside by both children and adults to express themselves in public spaces. We are lifting up that art form to underscore the fact that vitality requires moving beyond the church walls and into the messiness of next. In the Baltimore Washington Conference, there are 165,000 professing members and disciples of Jesus Christ. If all of those 165,000 faithful and impactful disciples of Jesus Christ are indeed transforming the world for God's glory. Lives, churches, and communities will experience abundant life. We will leave our mark by being and doing all the good that we can in all the places that we can, as ever long as we can, while doing no harm. We will leave our mark by faithfully working within and beyond the four walls of the church to join with God at work in the world. We will leave our mark by building beloved community as we bring our God-given gifts to envision, mobilize, and implement social good. We will leave our mark by partnering and collaborating with our local schools and other entities that seek the greatest common good. We will leave our mark by consistently building warm, quality, transformational relationships to ensure that people have what they need to thrive and live abundant lives. We have opened the chat so that you might share what mark you feel called to make. We ask you to commit to making your mark as Christ followers so that all might live life to the fullest, so that there are more harvest hands, so that we love as Christ loves us. So please, share this information with church leadership. We'll be posting results from Menti and an FAQ in addition to the content that is already on bwcumc.org forward slash vitality. We also ask you to see all the people better by sending two to three people from your congregation to the virtual Comparative Insight Workshop on Saturday, June 25th from nine until noon. But most importantly, we ask you to pray.
let us remember that we are ever going on to perfection and that our hope is in Christ alone. I want to thank Discipleship Ministries for leading us in such a powerful, immersive experience. If there is anybody in the Baltimore Washington Conference who now claims they don't understand what vitality is all about, I'm going to wonder where they've been. Christy, thank you for an excellent and powerful presentation. Mission and Ministry in Motion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And as we talked about seeing all the people, making connections, having deep and lasting partnerships, there is someone who has embodied that for us across multiple generations. She and her beloved connected with youth and young adults in ways that I've quite never seen before. There's testimony after testimony of how young people felt loved and encouraged and were invited to bring their gifts and the best of themselves. They felt included. They were allowed to lead. They were allowed to not just have voice, but to see their ideas come to fruition. They began serving the conference under the name Joyful Noise. And what a joyful noise they helped all of us make as we came together in various uh, youth events when they started at the district level and then came to be known as Rock. Well, Becky and Tom Price were rocks for this Baltimore Washington conference. And we could not be more grateful for the seeds that they planted, for the ways that they have imbued exactly what Jesus Christ modeled for us in young people and young adults. It, it, will take, it will take generations for all of the fruit that they've helped plant to really continue to thrive and to grow. Becky has shared with us that she's ready now to move on into the next season of her life. But we wanted to take this opportunity to say thank you. Christy, as someone who's worked side by side with her in leading our young people, talk to us about a little of how, you, how you've experienced Becky and Tom. Well, Becky and Tom have been a, a gift to me as well as the conference, and they really have 
sought to always put God and the kids first. Like anything and any time that you've been with them, um, you know that you can't escape how deep their love is for God and for young people. And the ways in which that um, I've talked, I remember talking with Tom when I first encountered the Baltimore Washington Conference back in 2004, when he was in that role, all the way through Becky and their vision for what it really means to offer Christ to everyone. Um, and we will, um, as, 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 as we know, we are gonna, I was in denial a bit, I gotta say when I got the resignation letter, when we got that resignation letter, I was a bit in denial, but uh, celebrate the faithfulness of these two uh, people. And, the, and, and Becky, we love you. We love you. Absolutely. And Becky did tell us that she went into deep prayer and asked God, was it time for her to pass this mantle on to someone else to now begin a new season with our youth and young adult? And she heard the voice of God tell her, it's okay to move into your next season. So as much as we all have been in denial, Becky, we love you. We thank you. We celebrate you. We're encouraged by you, and we also celebrate that it is your time to, to see what God has for you in your next season. And so, yes, just as we always say, we mourn, but we, all, but we don't mourn as folks without hope. We know you're not going too far. You will continue to be a presence and a gift to all in the Baltimore-Washington Conference. Thank you, and may God richly bless you. Gonna get take a 15 minute break or a 10 minute break? Where are we? 15 minutes? We have time for a 15 minute break. Um, when you come back, we're going to be doing brave conversations. And so please do be prepared to be, this is what, the time that we're gonna go into small groups. So please, if you're, if you're sharing a device with somebody, please don't so that we can, when we put people in groups, we don't end up with five people around a camera with. 12 other people, right? So, so um, please take this time to um, refresh the, 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 the coffee or tea or whatever you're drinking, to get on camera on a device by yourself, and to enter this space out of the fullness of this morning, knowing just how much God loves us, God loves and, and, ex and expects us to overflow that love to others. And we look forward to having this brave, beloved conversation when we come back. Thank you.
themselves or even someone else to do it. Lastly, we will want to show that they'll be a good for it by themselves.
Greetings, beloved. Thank you for catching a glimpse of why vitality is so important and how you might engage it. In this context of rich images and vitality, let us go deeper as we center and focus on our relationship with God and one another. I am inviting you to journey with us in and enable this virtual space to be brave space, to be a place where we can deeply engage one another. We will start with this prayer. Take a look. God of all creation, unbound by space and time, we confess our weariness as we log on once more in search of a holy connection. Though we would not choose to meet this way, we hold to the promise that you choose always to meet us where we are. When we feel the inadequacy of digital presence, Remind us that you, O oh Lord, are fully present, even here. When we feel the strain of needing to perform who we are, when we are seen but not known, remind us that you, O oh Lord, know us completely. When we are tempted to trust the illusion of the screen and flatten others in dismissal, Remind us that behind each square sits a living, breathing child of God. Behind each comment, a person in need of your love. When we fail to engage others well, show us your grace. When others fail to engage us well, may we show your grace. When it feels as though even our prayers are spoken into a void, speak to us your words of life, which never return empty. When we come to the edge of our limits, surprise us again with the fullness of your life, a life that lives in and flows through each of us, unhindered by blurry pixels and distorted sound. Lord Jesus Christ, image of the invisible God, give us faith to see your substance in the virtual. O Christ, in whom all things hold together, hold us together even in this time of physical separation. By your Spirit, make us one, as your Spirit has always done that in the endless bluish glow that illumines our days and nights, we might be able still to see your endless light. Amen. So for the next 90 minutes, again, we'll be centered and focused on our relationship with God and one another. We begin with this text. Jesus said, a new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. John chapter 13, verse 34. So I'm inviting you to journey with us and enable this space again to be brave space where we can deeply engage one another, 
We've already moved from a, a, a webinar earlier to a meeting set up so that we can better connect with one another and so that we can have holy and vital conversations face to face, phone to phone, uh, using the resources that we have and further keep one another safe. Again, this is sacred time. And so we begin, uh, we've already had time to break and we keep on uh, moving with the awareness that we are unhindered by what is before us, what is behind us, so that we can be fully present now. Amen. All right. We're God's children. We are created in God's image. We are beloved, precious, fearfully and wonderfully made. We are carriers of God's breath and are to be led by God's spirit. We are Christ's disciples and we carry this message called the good news of Jesus Christ in a world in desperate need of it. And we acknowledge that God so loved the world and that God gave God's only begotten son so that whosoever believes in God would not perish, but have everlasting life. And isn't it good to know that the same God who died so that the world, the people and everything in it could have salvation is the same God who cares about how we live here and now on earth. Beloved, imagine what our communities would look like if we truly, truly, deeply loved one another inside and beyond the church building like Jesus loves. If we believed that each of us lives in the very presence of God, within the brave circles of God's grace, how might we live knowing that God loves and is with us always in all we are, in all we think, do, or say, and in all of our relationships, how might our relationships be different if differences were respected and valued as not bad, not good, not hated, not inferior, not superior, but simply different. How might human dignity and our discipleship journey go hand in hand? This kind of love requires us to do the hard work of living and loving like Jesus, yes. And it demands that we become aware of and reduce our biases, prejudices, preferences, and we all have them. We have them. And it requires us to be patient, truth tellers, truth seekers, and truth receivers amidst our fears and levels of comfort. And so beloved, we're not here in this sacred space together to trivialize, debate, minimize or deny anyone's experience. This work is first about doing no harm, being fully present with one another, about doing good, listening well, and about attending to the ordinances of God. And we also acknowledge that these conversations and the work of inclusion, equity, diversity, and anti-racism is multi-layered. And we know that with every conversation and action taken, there are more steps and actions to take. These actions may or may not be comfortable. And yet, we have to start somewhere and we have to all be in these conversations and in this work. We have to recognize, and we recognize, uh, those of you who have been in this work for a lifetime and those who've been examples of how to do this work well as people of faith, whatever you've done to advance this ministry in accordance with the gospel mandate to love well, thank you. Together, we endeavor to respect the image of God in the other on a daily basis and denounce every act of indifference, every act of hate or indifference. Now, that's the foundational message and is rooted in these six actions or traits required to create a culture of beloved community. And these traits are seek and build relationships because this is how Jesus lived, respect different forms of expression, understanding that I may not know what is what is going on. Three, exam examine my own assumptions and perceptions so that I might avoid projecting my cultural values onto others. Assume positive intent as we are all moving on to perfection. Listen for understanding because agreement is optional and exercise cultural humility, understanding that the world in which I was born is just one model of reality. We seek to create brave space so that we might be able to do deep work together. Now the term brave space first emerged on college campuses among faculty and students working in interracial dialogue. 
and they realized that the common idea of safe space was an illusion, particularly for those who've been most marginalized. What's more too often, folks were confusing a safe space with a comfortable space. Learning to sit with each other's truths means we have to learn to sit with discomfort. And being in honest conversation with each other takes bravery, both to be vulnerable and to stay present in the face of hurt feelings, knowing, beloved, that we won't be and aren't perfect. So uh, we begin with this Brave Space poem. And while you're on mute, I'm just going to invite you to read the words on the screen as able as they're projected. There is no such thing as safe space. We exist in the real world. We all carry scars and have caused wounds. This space seeks to turn down the volume of the world outside and amplify voices that have to fight to be heard elsewhere. This space will not be perfect. It will not always be what we wish it to be, but it will be our space together and we will work on it side by side. At this time, I'd like to review with you the uh, guidelines for our time together, and it's called Respectful Communications and, and Mutual Invitation. So what you'll see on the screen you'll, by Eric Law, the Respectful Communications Guidelines. So R, we take responsibility for what we say without blaming others. E, we use empathic listening. S, we are sensitive to differences uh, in, in communication styles. P, we'll ponder what we think before we actually speak. E, we'll examine our own assumptions and perceptions. C, we'll keep confidentiality. And T, we'll tolerate ambiguity uh, because we are all learners and, 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 and in this space together um, as equals, okay? So at this time, uh, just to help us get, get acquainted to this, this new platform that we're on together at, where we can actually uh, engage one another, we can see each other, we can use our voice in the space as best able. I'm going to ask you when you go into your breakouts to share your responses to these questions. Number one, what's your name? Two, where is home for you? Uh, where do you feel most at home? Again, what's your name? Where is home for you? Where do you feel most at home? And this does not have to be a geographic place. And if you have additional time, uh, here's an option for going deeper. Who or what does your heart break for? Who or what does your heart break for? We'll have about five minutes and then we'll return back to the main session. Hello. 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 It looks like we're we're still we might still be in the main session. So um, they're working to get the facilitators who have an asterisk in their name into rooms. So please be patient as we do that. This is like the biggest Zoom meeting we've done. I think we're still in the main room. I can't tell. Um, we're in the main room. Yeah. So so we're we're gonna we're gonna wait and be patient for um, open all rooms. Nothing is happening is what the tech uh, people are saying to me. So I guess we're all in the meeting, all of us. So we're gonna ask people to mute. Good News TV is muting everybody. Thank you, Good News TV for doing this gargantuan task of dividing 400 people into a uh, breakout room. So everyone who's had to deal with the Zoom understands that sometimes what we practice doesn't happen. So we're gonna practice non-anxious leadership and we're gonna give God thanks for this time of, 
of building beloved community with one another. Looking forward to seeing all of you in the rooms. Yeah. Hi, I have 24 on my screen. All right, bye. They are working on the solution to this. So thank you for your patience. And we could all practice coming off camera because we're about ready to go into breakout rooms. Hello friends, we just wanna let you know that we're having some technical difficulties with the breakout rooms. So please just stand by, uh, continue to be patient with us. We appreciate your presence and engagement in this process. And we will let you know as soon as these breakout rooms are, all, are ready to go. All right, so thanks again for your patience.
gracious creator, redeemer, and sustainer. May our gratitude toward you and your blessings be so evident that we become like the life-giving breath we breathe. When we look into our past, we see your grace showering us like rain, even when we thought it could not get any worse. In our present, make us aware of your presence so deeply that the space between this world and heaven is a yeah. gossamer thin veil. In our future, may our hope be piercing into the darkness of the unknown, guiding our hearts closer to you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Christ. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Amen.
morning, everyone. Morning. 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 Good morning. Good morning. Morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. How's Good morning. everyone doing? Good morning. Are we in our rooms yet? No. We're back, uh, we're back we're in the main room. Ask us to meet. Every I was in, now I'm out. <laughs> so I'm in this group now. I guess I'm I guess I'm in. I'm not sure. <laughs> I think we're all we all in the main, the main room. room. We're all together again. Stay oh. muted, please. Stay muted. Everybody, please stay muted. Have conversations face to face, right? We would be able to share our names and our stories and, and, and talk a little bit in person about what our hearts break for, or where we're from, or where it's home for us. But unfortunately, we, we may or may not have been able to do that well in this space. So again, I thank you so much for your engagement. I thank you for sharing what you were able to share because each of our stories reflects the intersection and interwovenness of, our, of many of our identities, right? We have different cultures, backgrounds, different generations, uh, different come from different congregations. And there are other differences that make up our identities. And we understand that, that we have work to do personally to be all that God has called us and created us to be. And there's much unfinished about us, about the church. And we desire to focus our time today on how racism impacts each of us as noted in the United Methodist uh, Constitution, paragraph five, article five. And what's in that is so important for us to think through, especially right now, especially as we are in this brave conversation. And it says, since its inclusion in the United Methodist Church, Constitution 1968, the United Methodist Church proclaims the value of each person as a unique child of God and commits itself to the healing and wholeness of all persons. The United Methodist Church recognizes that the sin of racism has been destructive to its unity throughout its history. And racism continues to cause painful division and marginalization. The United Methodist Church shall confront and seek to eliminate racism, whether in organizations or in individuals, in every facet of its life and in society at large. The United Methodist Church shall work collaboratively with others to address concerns that threaten the cause of racial justice at all times and in all places. Now, this is in our Book of Discipline, has been there since 1968. Again, it's par paragraph five, article five. And while there are many important conversations we could have today about respecting differences, we don't have time to talk about more than one, right? Uh, but we, and so we've, we've chosen to focus on racism as this is at the root of, of, of so much hate and othering in America right now. So here, here are the ground rules for us today. Please be present. Uh, this, this can look like turning off your notifications on your phones, not paying attention to other screens, uh, turning the video off if you need to step away or you just can't be present. Someone, something else just needs your attention. It's being aware of what's going on in and around you. Uh, also to understand that this experience is yours and, and to respect and honor the experience of others. When we speak, we want to uh, begin and stick with I statements and avoid advice giving unless someone suggests it. This isn't the time that we try to fix, save, advise, or correct each other. In this space, we are patient and respectful with speaking turns and speaking times. Uh, notice that if you're talking more than someone else, that, that you'll step back and give another voice a chance to be heard. And we also understand that silence can be powerful together. And we welcome that silence has, has a lot to say as much as speech. I want to be aware of erasure, understanding that empathy is putting ourselves on the, uh, in, it is not uh, putting ourselves in someone else's shoes. It's appreciating 
how very different it is to be who you are, right? Uh, confidentiality, what happens at the table, what happens in the virtual space, what happens in the room, uh, remains in that room. No quotes or identifying details will be shared without permission. Now, there are, uh, we, we have facilitators who are here with us, and if you are able to see them on the, the Zoom, uh, if they wanna just wave right now so that you can see who they are, uh, these are individuals who, who will, um, who have agreed to help us to maintain the rules of this time together. Now, since the breakout rooms aren't quite uh, ready and, 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 and this is a, a large group and we want to make sure that, that we can at least have an experience here today, we're going to maintain, uh, our, our maintain this, this group space. So we're not going to move into our breakout rooms. We're going to all be here together, which will greatly need your support and help. Okay, um, so we're not going to move you into breakout rooms so that you can have individual conversation or smaller group conversations so that that'll be different. So when you come back on June 25th, if you're willing to join us, you'll notice that we will have smaller group conversations. But for the sake of our time today, we're going to all be together. All right. So uh, as Dusha Hockett often says, I need you to bend with me a little bit uh, and just remain flexible. And then at the appropriate time, I may ask some brave individuals to, to offer your voice in this space. Okay? So we'll continue on. All right. So here's our question When was the last time you felt truly heard? or known and or you can ask add your response to the question the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. spoke of a vision of a world where his children will not be judged by the color of their skin but by the content of their character what do these words mean to your reality and vision how has skin color impacted your existence all right, I wanna go back to those questions so that you have them again, and we're gonna ask those questions to be placed in the chat for you. When was the last time you felt truly heard or known? Second question you can respond to is the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. spoke of a vision of a world where his children will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character what do these words mean to your reality and vision? How has skin color impacted your existence? And, and, and if we have more time, some time for further re reflection, here's the question. What am I doing to create an environment where othering or hate is untaught or challenged? What am I doing to create an environment where othering or hate is untaught or challenged all right those are our questions and we'll have some time together so we're going to take about 30 minutes to have a conversation 30 minutes to have a conversation and i'm going to invite a person who feels led to come off mute so this is a brave space this is a respectful space where we do no harm right you're going to come off mute and i'm going to ask you to respond to one of those questions all right so at this time, we invite you to do so now. Hey, this is um Walter, Walter Jackson. I'll Thank I'll go. Thank oh, you. and I'm from I'm from Chase United Methodist Church. So I'll I'll try to take one that I think is kind of um difficult but impactful. And I think the way that you verbalized it is, what do I do to create an environment where othering or hate is not taught or is challenged? And um, what I try to do is accept people the way that they are and not judge people for being the way that they are. And I also strive to not um, transfer negativity onto myself, but to project positivity. Because I think that um, when we see people, we see the outside. I don't know what's going on on the inside. I don't know what happened um, before you left your home. I don't know what 
your life experiences were. Um, I don't know any of that. I don't know how you feel. So I try not to take anything that I perceive initially. I try to um, just realize that you're processing your life and doing the best that you can, and I'm going to do the best that I can. And I also try to be forgiving and work with people because I want people to work with me. And I also think about not just me, but what if it was my child or my spouse or somebody that I really cared for? I would like another person to give them the benefit of the doubt. So I try to give others the benefit of the doubt and to work with them. And then the last thing that I attempt to do is to be honest. If something isn't right or if I think that I'm being treated unfairly or someone else is, I speak to it. And I know that to speak to it, I don't have to be cruel, mean-hearted, disagreeable. I should still strive to display the fruits of the spirit. But I think that it's important to be honest and to not be dishonest with myself and just harbor bad feelings and negative feelings because then I feel the poison on the inside. So I just try to let people know because um, if you don't tell a person, they won't know, they won't understand. Sometimes when I feel like I'm being hurt or I'm being disrespected, it's because they didn't understand that that's how I feel, you know, because everybody doesn't um, react or respond to others the way that I do. So those are some of the things that I try to do. I just try to be transparent. I try to be honest. I try to be fair. Um, and, you know, I want to be treated justly. So therefore, I should treat other people justly. And that, that really helps me to um, work with people a little bit more. So I don't know if that was a good answer, but that's my answer. And I'm sticking to it. Um, and that's all I got. Thank you. Thank you, Walter. Thank you. We appreciate it. Honesty, just uh, to, 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 to be just, to be transparent, to be, to be honest, to, to understand that individuals come into the space with many different uh, experiences and to be empathetic, to be compassionate. Thank you so much. Is there someone else who will share at this time? I'm going to share. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> Um, so I am Brady Frank. I am the director of music and worship at Emory Fellowship. Mm -hmm. And so um, I am here with a, a little different uh, perspective because uh, my prior military experience, I have realized that every person is important. Um, and so I'm, I'm pretty much answering the same question. I think when I look at my upbringing, I see that there is a lack of accountability and responsibility. For whatever reason, we're in a time and a day and an age where we do not hold people accountable. Mm. I have several close friends and family members. They know there's certain things that they cannot say around me. There's certain things that they cannot do around me because I'm gonna speak against it. And, and again, like the brother said, it's not being harsh or being harmful or saying anything that's gonna present poison to them, but it's to let them know that, hey, you, you can't say that around me or that's not acceptable. And so what we've done is started giving people, I believe, I believe we started giving people passes over and over again. And so they, it becomes normal and it becomes something that they feel is okay. And the more that you let it go on, the more that it starts to fester and start to affect and infect um, various people. So I, myself, I always make sure that I hold people accountable, myself first, and then, you know, whether it's uh, my parent, my mom, my brother, um, my wife, anybody, if, if it's not true and it's not right and it's not in love, then I do speak against it. And so I, I am known for being the person that's going to always adhere to integrity and making sure that people are accountable. So just for me, in that space and in that environment. I just believe in accountability and responsibility so that people can, can be aware of their actions and understand that things around me are not okay. So that's what I do personally to kind of ensure that hate and um, you know other things of that nature are not present 
um, in my vernacular because it's something that I just don't tolerate. And so I hope that that kind of carries on to other people so that one person at a time, you know, um, we can at least start to change if nothing else, but in our household or just in our community. And from there, hopefully it grows and, and furthers itself. Thank you. Thank you. Stacy, this is Carol Travis. I just want to say to the question, what am I doing? Um, mm -hmm. I, I strongly believe in a, in a ministry of presence. Uh, and my presence is I show up. Um, I show up in places where um, there are all white groups, where there are all African-American groups. And as you get to know people and start to, 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 to actually build some sort of relationship with people, uh, you get to understand them and know who they are. Uh, I'm a big believer in the work of the late Junius Dotson. I've sat in many sessions with him and I really believe in seeing people, seeing people for who they are, where they are. But my biggest thing is to just show up, uh, whether it's on Zoom, whether it's in person um, and build relationships from there. Uh, we have been in a difficult time, but during the pandemic, I've managed to still maintain my relationships. I've met new people. I uh, have new people in my network, and I'm always looking to see who I can add, who I can partner with, and who I can work with. So that's me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Showing up, being present. Hey. Yes. Everyone hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Um, I'm sort of in a dilemma, and I often pray that God will search my own heart. Being a person that grew up in segregation, uh, being in the military in the time that it was segregated, um, not segregated, but there was a lot of prejudice. Hmm. Um, you know, I often think about the time when I was in basic training. And when I finished my basic training, I was in a military uniform. And in Augusta, Georgia, I had to go to the cult side of the bus station to get my ticket to come back to Baltimore. Um, you learn to forgive, but you don't forget all the time. And I have to ask God to deal with me to remove the biases that I have in my own heart before I can deal with any situation. Powerful. Thank you so much. I have to deal with the biases in my own heart. Uh, first, building that self capacity uh, to do the work. Thank you so much. Thank you. Is may, I, may I share? Yes, please, please. Um, one of the things that um, I actively seek to have um, conversations across racial lines, ethnic lines, class lines. And um, the latest thing that I've done is to actually engage my members of my congregation to be in conversation with other people beyond our denomination and who are um, of another racial group to actually explore the book, um, White Fragility and have a whole it was, a, it was six months worth of conversation. But in the midst of that, even before we had that conversation, we had to have a conversation about um, not code switching. Mm. And folk need to explore that a little bit more about how we change when we're in the presence of other groups so that we can be accepted mm -hmm. or that our conversation will be understood so that we're not imposing or we're not harming. Mm -hmm. Reality is, is that once we stopped code switching, we were able to really get into some very deep and meaningful conversations. One of the things that occurred was that we, we were doing this virtually. And at the end, we all got, were able to all get together um, in one location to meet each other personally. And friendships have been, have been formed because it wasn't an intellectual exercise. It became a personal exercise. Um, and that was very, very different. But having to push 
each other to be honest, to be open, to be in conversation, and not to be accusatory, but rather to explore. Mm. Um, and it was very difficult. One of the uh, many of the assumptions that were made about being black, about being um, in our community where so much violence occurs, is that we were not educated. And they found out that many of my folk had higher levels of education than they did, you know, and so and, and had some some similar experiences. And once we were able to break through that, it was a really deep conversation about what we had been exposed to, what we had learned, and, um, and where we go from there. Um, so our activity right now is about building peace and trying to, and when I say building peace, I'm talking about justice, not the absence of activity, but the pursuit of justice and actually trying to figure out how we do this. Um, so we have gone to the other and made them our friends. Mm. And we consistently ask, how can someone else be other if we are a part of the body of Christ? But it's a, it's a difficult work and it has to continue. Excellent, thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, I have one. Thank you. Please share. Um, yeah, Malcolm. I'm going to share a, a couple of instances where I, well, let me explain. I was having a dinner in a restaurant, and the waiter who was sponsored for my area happened to be a young black man. So I sat down at my table, I sat and sat and sat, and right across from me was a white family who this waiter called on and went to repeatedly and kindly ignored me. I had to wait a long time to get water, a long time to get a menu and everything. Meanwhile, he was catering to this white family in the next table. At the end of the meal, I said, you know what? I can't let this go. <laughs> so I called him aside and I told him how his action made me feel. As I was sitting there, being unrecognized and not being waited on. I thought about the whole thing about slave mentality and white superiority and things like all that stuff came back to me and it really, really was painful. So I had to call this to his attention how he made me feel. He looked embarrassed, <laughs> was apologetic. I said, okay, as long as you understand what your actions speak of, you need to be conscious of how you treat other people look like you. And so I, I hope he learned from that and took that uh, graciously and able to like change his behavior and so forth. And that's happened to me more than once, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. So Thank again, you. being accountable, we got, to, we got to call these things up. Thank you. Thank you. May I uh, share a personal experience? Yes, please do. Okay. I'm a United Methodist clergy. I have been in the ministry since 1973. In the middle 80s, I was single and I had a beautiful district superintendent. And he said, Stan, you're not gonna find fulfillment until you get your nice wife. And when you find that special young lady, I'm gonna invite you to dinner and we are gonna have a great celebration. Well, after a year or so, looking around, and God, and God put someone in my life. And I told him, I called him, I was all excited. So I got somebody that I love, and she loved me, and, and we we're going to get married. And he said, okay, Stan, great, great, great. We're going to invite you over to dinner. Well, guess what happened? When he found out who the person was, he changed every color except what he really was. Hmm. Unfortunately, the young lady was Caucasian. She was white. And my district superintendent could not deal with that. Mm. And it's been almost 50 years. I don't know where he is now. But I remember at an annual conference, my wife, who was white outside, but inside, she was everything else. 
And she met him in a hole, and I never forget his expression. It was five years later, and she went up to him and said, Dave, we are still waiting for our dinner invitation. Hmm. And he looked at her, and he couldn't say a word. All he can do was hang his head and walk away. Hmm. Now, that's inside. That's people that you're supposed to look up to. That was my district superintendent. And when we got married, he made sure that he figured out a way to be out of town. Not only that, my bishop, who was African-American, called my wife and I together and looked at us and said, you are going to cause problems for our conference. And my beautiful wife, she looked at him and said, that's why you're here, to help solve the problem. My beloved, I was looking at a football game once, and I'm, I'll be finishing in a second. And it was about two cops. One was black and one was white. And the black cop was the supervisor of the young white patrolman. And they got a call. There was a break-in in a warehouse. And the white cop, the black cop said to the white to, to the white cop, whatever you do, when we go, don't shoot, don't shoot, please don't shoot. And so when they got into the warehouse, there was a young man came toward the white cop with a knife. And the white cop took his gun out and shot him in the stomach. Hmm. And when he shot him in the stomach, his his kidneys were destroyed. And they said that we, he's going to die if we can't find a donor. And so everybody was tested and no one qualified to give him a new kidney. And so finally, this black cop said, try me, try me. And so they tested that black cop and he said, it matched, it matched. And so the black cop went in there, got on the bed, give the white guy half of his kidney. And they both survived. Now, here's what I want to leave you with. The, the, the black cop had a little 10 year old daughter mm. and her mother was getting ready to put her to bed. And she was telling her about what her father had done. Mm -hmm. And she said, mama, 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 how can a black man kidney be put into a white man's body and they both live? The mother looked at her beautiful little daughter and said, sweetheart, I want you to never forget this. We are all the same hmm. on the inside. Hmm. We are all the same on the inside. That's my experience I want to share with you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We're all the same on the inside. May I please share? Please. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'd like to speak to um, the question raised regarding Dr. Martin Luther King. And it's difficult to even talk about that right now, considering for the past several weeks, we have been consumed by Black people being killed in a grocery store a doctor being killed at a hospital, mm -hmm. uh, children being slaughtered in a school. Mm -hmm. uh, we just spent about a year um, mm -hmm. dissecting the letter of Martin Luther King mm -hmm. from Birmingham jail. And the question was raised, would Dr. King have the same thought that he did in the question that is before us this morning mm -hmm. about the content of our character mm -hmm. and the color of our skin. And in reality, has it really impacted you personally? Yes, it has. It's becoming more and more difficult. And in the difficulty, I become strengthened more and more to speak to racism, to speak to those who think nothing of hurting, dismissing, 
uh, persons simply because of the color of their skin. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't envy you having to raise this issue mm -hmm. on a day after we just experienced what happened on yesterday, mm -hmm. but I encourage you mm -hmm. to keep on doing it. Please mm -hmm. continue. Thank you. Thank you. Again. Adam, can I speak? Yes, please. Please do. My name is Nelson Gardner, and I go to uh, Calvary United Methodist Church of Annapolis. I grew up in PG County during segregation. I'm 71 years old right now. And I took a class um, recently at my church. And uh, excuse me, this is not good. Um, but it was about racism. And it was a black and white preacher that had dialogue. Hmm. And it really changed me. I took it upon myself to meet a, a black person every day or a person of color, Hispanic, Chinese, whatever. And I did that for a couple of months. Where I would just engage with people, ask them their name, and repeat it. The deal is real simple. We have to take action. I'm not a person of words. My background is engineering and numbers and all that stuff. But I'm a musical evangelist. And a uh, soon to be certified lay speaker. I'm the paperwork in the mill right now. And I uh, set up a nonprofit last year called In His Grip Ministries. And the purpose of that ministry is to spread God's word through music. And the song, Jesus Loves Me, tells the whole story. It's that simple. Red and yellow, black and white, we are precious in his sight, period. And all you got to do is get out there and take action. You know, I'm just going to leave it right there. I've been called to knit. The races together. I'm working in Indianapolis district and it's work. I was down in the field in Lothian, six churches, four bands. I've got racial elements in my music. Next Friday night and coffee houses at our church. And it's it's just the, feels like the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate all who've shared in this space. And before we move on, I just want to make sure that we have the, the, the ethnic diversity represented in this conference. Uh, so if there are other persons who would like to just offer a, a, a brief comment uh, into this conversation before we move on to our wrap up, we would love to hear from you. Uh, and so we'll, we'll, we'll make space and time for you to do so now. If there's at least one or two others, please share. Could I jump in real fast? Yes. Um, I just want to share that for me, the biggest thing that changes me is um, when I invite other people, and it's not always easy to do because there are boundaries that we all set up, but when I invite them to be authentic with me, mm -hmm. and, and I sometimes take the first step to be authentic with them, it helps me take the log out of my eye so that I can see and hear and live better. Hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much. May I speak? I am. <laughs> May I speak? Yes, please do. My name is uh, Joseph Smith from St. Luke United Methodist Church. This will be brief. I'm 73 years old and eldership it's very important that you're trying to serve God at my age. Don't worry about what the person looked like on the other side of you. Be a good elder. Hmm. But I mean, by that, I mean this, three things. You do no harm. You use one of the most powerful tools God gave you, the spirit of goodwill. And be respectful. But being an elder also, speak as an elder. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean speaking down to people, but it means speaking to people. And listen, 
have a conversation. And if they don't come across like you want, again, exercise goodwill. Mm. But God give us that gift so we can commune. And even if you don't feel you did it at, at that time, even when you're gone, they're going to remember what was said and they can look at you and see the intent mm -hmm. and that may lead to a change. Thank you. Thank you so mm -hmm. much. That, that's all the time we have for open comments. So I appreciate every single one of you. Thank you so much. I'm going to ask those of you who, who are able to please mute your, your line. But I want you to know how important this moment is for us. And, and, and I, just, I just want to thank you once again for being a part of this brave space, for, for remaining engaged in this work. Uh, we know, we absolutely know that this is not enough time to, to have this conversation, to, to come up with concrete solutions, com complex situations have complex solutions, right? We, we are aware of this, and we are aware that there are many, many critical issues that we need to address personally and congregationally. And we know that there are many that we are facing together as a people of God. So again, I just want to thank you for just pausing for just a, a few minutes of your day, of your time, of your week, to be in community with us. And, and, and by that, I mean to, to be in this virtual space together and then to make a commitment to continue these conversations uh, where you are, where you exist. So I want to give you some, some other opportunities to have conference-wide conversations. Uh, and, and, and those are on June 5th, uh, 20, I'm sorry, June 25th. We will have another opportunity uh, to journey together and have a brave conversation for two hours. I believe it's from 10 to 12, from 10 to 12. Then we'll have uh, on September 8th, the launch of the next community, the Journey to Beloved Community course. Uh, there we have tools for you in your local congregation and we will begin to give you additional resources to go deeper in this work. And additionally, we will have brave conversation resources available for con consultation with your congregation as needed. So for those of you who would like to have contextual conversations, you'll be able to contact us to do so. Um, we have encountered uh, great conversation in this space and glimmers of what can happen when we are uh, together unafraid to have these kinds of conversations. And in the words of James Baldwin, we know that not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. Thank you so much. The great love of God calls us to put our faith into action as we witness to Jesus Christ in the world, follow his teachings through acts of worship, justice, compassion, devotion under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. May God continue to bless and keep you and send us forth into the world to be love at work. Thank you again. God bless you. In the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus is asked the question, which is the greatest commandment? He answered, love God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your mind. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. And then again, at the Last Supper, he says the same thing, but with a twist, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciple. In the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus is asked the question, which is the greatest commandment? He answered, love God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your mind. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. And then again, at the Last Supper, he says the same thing, but with a twist, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples. This time, Jesus replaced your neighbor with one another. This new love that Christ commands of us goes much deeper than the Old Testament commandment he was quoting in Matthew. The people we have been commanded to love has expanded beyond our neighborhoods to include, well, everyone. And this includes people who might make this commandment 
a bit difficult. Like that confrontational coworker who just seems impossible to get along with, or your in-laws who've never treated you like a part of the family, or maybe the person you just met who you don't even know and really need some help. You see, Jesus knew his physical time on earth was nearing an end. So in this new take on the old commandment, Jesus also made another change. The words as yourself became as I have loved you. Wow, that's a tough act to follow. Christ's sacrificial life provides a clear and concrete example of real and true love. And he put this love on display on a daily basis with his disciples. He was patient with them, speaking kindly and showing great concern for their welfare. He instructed, counseled, and comforted them, prayed with them and for them. He admonished them for wrongdoing and yet compassionately bore with their failings. And most of all, he gave his life, dying so that they and we might live. According to Jesus, this is how others will know that you are one of his followers, not because you have a shirt or a bumper sticker that says so, not because we announce it from a stage or a blog or a status update, but because they look at you, at how you live, the things you do and say, and they see Jesus. They see love. Beloved of God, thank you so much. Thank you for engaging in this immersive experience as you did this morning. Thank you for being willing to engage in brave conversation. We know that that takes a vulnerability. It takes a willingness to move out of your comfort zone. That's what we're going to need to continue to see more of as we all live into God's preferred future for us. Thank you. I'll now turn once more to our conference secretary, Kevin, for some closing announcements. Thank you, Bishop. The service of commissioning and ordination at 6 p.m. will be live streamed. That link is on our conference website. If you've not already made donations to the conference appeals and offerings, you may give electronically on our website or use the link that will be showing up in the chat now. At this point, Bishop, I move that the 238th annual session of the Baltimore Washington Conference stand adjourned and that all reports provided to the conference secretary, which are not otherwise acted on, be considered received by the annual conference and that unfinished business be referred to the appropriate conference agency for consideration and action and report it at the next session of the annual conference. Further, that the 239th annual session of the Baltimore Washington Conference be convened at the call of the presiding bishop at the Hilton Baltimore Inner Harbor on May 31st, 2023. Further, that the Conference Discipleship Council, the Conference Connectional Table, and the appropriate boards, commissions, councils, and committees be instructed, authorized, and empowered to handle all appropriate business or emergencies between meetings of the Baltimore Washington Conference, according to the rules and structure of the conference, provided the requirements of the 2016 edition of the Book of Discipline of the United Methodist Church are not violated in any situation. Bishop, I turn it back to you. Excellent, thank you so much, Kevin. Did you hear that? The 239th session of the Baltimore Washington Conference will bring us all back together at the Hilton in Baltimore to be in holy conferencing together. I know we yearn, amen, amen. We yearn to be together again. So let's start praying now, beloved, that nothing would interfere. We rebuke anything that would try to prevent us from coming together. I've said throughout these three days that it takes a village and it absolutely does. So I want to take a moment to thank our worship team, Sherry Wood Poe, Andre Briscoe, Kyle Durbin, Brashawn Jenkins, Suzanne Jones, and Olivia Gross.
I want to thank Good News TV for all of their work behind the scene. You have no idea of how they have been moving and making sure that everything is just as we need it and even working through the technical difficulties so expertly. Thank you, David, and your team for all that you've done with us. We're grateful for our sign language interpreters, Becky Fry and Helen Chang. Thank you so much for what you've done for us. We want to, of course, thank everyone here at Glenmar United Methodist Church. As the young people say, the hospitality has been off the chain. Thank you so much. And even though she told me I don't have to call her name, thank you, Reverend Mandy Sayers, for everything that you've done for us. Milena Tice and Hirok Kim. I want to thank the district superintendents who have been available at a moment's notice for prayer and to provide information and to make contacts as they've needed to. Thank you. We call ourselves the flock, so I'm grateful that the flock has continued to fly together during this season of annual conference. I thank the sessions team for all of your planning, all of the ways that you have labored to make this a fruitful annual conference team. Beloved, I now set the appointments for the 2022 and 2023 appointment season. May God bless you as our servant leaders, both those pastors who are going to new appointments and those who are returning. I pray that your staff parish relations committee will rise and share with the congregation how grateful they are that if you're a returning pastor or how they anticipate the wonderful ministry that God will do through you as a new pastor. And remember, no pastor comes to solve all your problems. No pastor comes with some magic wand. It is the pastor and the congregation that work together to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. I'm grateful to Reverend Frankie Ravel for the word that he brought to us through the memorial service, and I am grateful for the word that Reverend Antoine Carlton Love will bring to us this evening uh, as we come together for a service of commissioning and ordination. It has been my privilege to sit and preside as your chair. If there were any mistakes or missteps, I pray that you will assign it to my head and not my heart, that you will be gracious and forgive me as we go on to perfection together. Thank you, beloved. We are now uh, closed. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> All right. Bixby, power off tablet.